want to learn how to care for a chest pain patient in the ER? Well, you're in the right place because in today's video, we are gonna approach chest pain from the ER nurse perspective. This video is perfect for you if you're switching to ER from a different unit or if you're a new grad. So grab your thinking cap and a drink and let's get started. So when we talk about chest pain, what are we actually worried about? Well, we're worried about a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, which we abbreviate MI. Now, what is an MI? Well, it's death of the heart muscle that's caused by an occlusion in a coronary artery or one of the arteries that supplies the heart with blood. So what are the signs and symptoms that somebody is having an MI? Well, the hallmark sign is chest pain, and that's the one that we always worry about, right? But there are other signs and symptoms that can accompany chest pain or other signs and symptoms that can stand on their own and it can still signal an MI even if the patient is not having chest pain. So like we said, the first sign and symptom of an MI is chest pain. And then there's also nausea and vomiting. The patient could be short of breath. They could be sweaty or diaphoretic and they could be pale or a little gray. And if they're gray, that's a really bad sign. So let's pause really quick and see how people describe their chest pain. So chest pain can be a pressure, it can be a squeezing, a crushing, a tightness, a sharp pain, or a burning pain. And then as far as severity, the pain can be really severe or it can be just kind of nagging and kind of there. Now, MI chest pain can radiate or it doesn't have to. And if the chest pain is gonna radiate, it's usually to the jaw, the neck, or the arm. Sometimes it can radiate to the back, but when we talk about chest pain radiating to the back, we often worry about other problems. Heart attack chest pain can also occur at rest or with activity. Now, one thing that you'll hear in clinical practice is that MI chest pain is not typically reproducible with palpation. So what does that mean? That means if I press on your chest, I cannot cause you to have chest pain. And this is because the chest pain of MI is deeper. Typically, if I press on the area that hurts and it causes you more pain, we think about that more as a musculoskeletal type pain. So let's pause really quick and talk about special populations. So women and diabetic patients won't always have that crushing chest pain that we typically think about. Sometimes they can have symptoms more like fatigue or some of those other symptoms that we talked about earlier. So when you're assessing a chest pain patient, some of the questions you might ask are, what symptoms are you having? When did the pain start? And I really like this one because it can point us to what their troponins might look like initially. Can you describe the pain? Is it a pressure? Is it a heaviness? Is it a sharp? Is it a stabbing pain? Does the pain get better with rest? Have you had a heart attack in the past? And if you did, do you have any stents or did you have open heart surgery? Did you take nitro before you came in? And if you did, how many and did it help? And then I also like to ask about risk factors. So do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Are you a smoker or a nicotine user? Are you a diabetic? Do you have any family members that have had heart attacks? And if they have, how old were they when they had that heart attack? And then you can kind of correlate that to the patient's age sometimes. But I typically ask the family history question a little bit later because there's other more important things that you're gonna need to be doing. Like... Getting an EKG. So the gold standard is that we need to complete an EKG within 10 minutes of a patient arriving in the ER if we are worried about them having acute coronary syndrome. So that's both unstable angina and an MI. And we'll talk about EKG changes in later videos, but SD elevation, that's bad. And we always correlate the EKG with things like blood work because EKG changes will not always show up on the first EKG, even if the patient is having an MI. 
So get your EKG and then obtain cardiac markers through things like blood work. And the cardiac marker that we test for is troponin. So start your IV and draw blood at the same time and send it to lab. Now, if the patient is still in the ER three hours later and the first troponin was negative, be prepared to draw a repeat three hour troponin. And why do we do this? We do this because even with heart damage or MI, troponin takes three to six hours to actually get into the bloodstream from the initial injury. So you'll also wanna place your patient on continuous cardiac monitoring. So put them on the five lead and hook them up to the heart monitor, that way everybody can see them at the nurse's station. And then you'll also anticipate that the physician will put in an order for a chest x-ray. And this is because chest x-rays can also help with differential diagnoses and identifying things like pneumonia, heart failure, or aneurysms. So we use the acronym MONA as a guide to help us with our nursing interventions in treating the chest pain patient. And MONA stands for morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and aspirin. And we don't exactly do these things in this order, but this acronym is essentially the priority nursing interventions. And if I rearrange the letters of this word to put it in the order that we actually do these things in, then I would get some weird word like OM. And what word is that? That's not even a word. What language is that? Now, why do we actually give the patient oxygen? Well, when you think about an MI and you think about the pain that's associated with a heart attack, that pain is an ischemic pain. The pain is caused because there's a clot that's in the artery that's not letting blood flow get to the heart and it's not letting oxygen get to the heart. So if you put your patient on some oxygen, that just helps promote oxygen delivery to the cardiac muscle. And the next thing you do is give aspirin, and it's usually a dose of about 325 milligrams unless the patient has an allergy to aspirin. If they do have an allergy, please don't give it. We don't need any more problems. The next step you'll do is usually administer nitroglycerin. And nitroglycerin is typically administered as one tablet sublingual every five minutes for three doses. And the reason that you give nitroglycerin is because it acts as a vasodilator. It opens up the coronary arteries and allows more blood supply and more oxygen to get to the heart and thereby help relieve the chest pain. Now, because nitroglycerin is a vasodilator, it will also drop your blood pressure. So you'll want to take a blood pressure after each dose of nitroglycerin. So you'll give one dose, wait five minutes and check your blood pressure and assess the patient's pain. If a patient is still having chest pain and the first nitro helped and their blood pressure is not in the toilet, go ahead and give your second dose. And then again, wait five minutes and check your blood pressure and assess the patient's pain before giving your third dose. Now the max of nitroglycerin is three doses at a time. So after you give all three tablets, don't give any more. Morphine may be ordered if the chest pain is not relieved by nitroglycerin. Morphine is the drug of choice for pain relief in acute MI because it causes vasodilation. You might also anticipate giving heparin if the patient is having an acute MI. And heparin is typically a bolus followed by a drip. And the reason that we give heparin is because it's a blood thinner and it prevents that coronary clot from getting any bigger. Now you might also give beta blockers IV if the patient is severely hypertensive. So you might give something like low presser if the patient is really hypertensive. And the reason that we like beta blockers is because they reduce the workload of the heart. And then you'll anticipate the patient going to the cath lab immediately if the patient is having a STEMI. If the patient's having an end STEMI, especially if it's an end STEMI at nighttime, you'll likely admit the patient and then they'll go to the cath lab at some point later. So a 50 year old male patient walks into the ER and they say they're having chest pain. What do you do? 
Well, if there's a bed open, you can go ahead and put that patient in a wheelchair, please don't make them walk, and wheel them to the back. While you're wheeling them to the back, go ahead and ask your questions. What symptoms are you having? When did this pain start? What kind of pain is it? Does it radiate? Does it go anywhere? Have you had a heart attack in the past? If you did, do you have nitro? Did you take your nitro? Did your nitro help? If you've never had a heart attack, do you have high blood pressure? Do you have high cholesterol? Are you a smoker? Are you a diabetic? Now, once the patient's butt hits the bed, we need to be getting an EKG and putting our patient on the monitor. Somebody hopefully will be able to help you. Put the patient on the stat probe, get their oxygen level. If they need oxygen, go ahead and put it on them. Grab some IV stuff. Go ahead and start your IV on your patient. That way you can draw your blood. Hopefully the physician is in the room at this time or not too far away. Then once they get there, they can put in their additional orders. You know, aspirin, morphine, nitro, chest x-ray, and those will all be done in the room. If the patient's having a STEMI, the STEMI team will be activated and you'll follow a different pathway. If the patient's having an N-STEMI, then typically we'll see that through a positive troponin or through ST depression on an EKG that's new. All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, feel free to comment down below and keep an eye out for a future video that's gonna break down the treatment differences between a STEMI and an N-STEMI. That'll be coming out soon, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Otherwise, stay safe and I'll see you guys next video.